Section 19 of Library of World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 4, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 19. Zadig the Babylonian, by Voltaire. Part 2. The Disputes and the Audiences. In this manner he daily discovered the subtlety of his genius and the goodness of his heart. The people at once admired and loved him. He passed for the happiest man in the world. The whole empire resounded with his name. All the ladies ogled him. All the men praised him for his justice. The learned regarded him as an oracle, and even the priests confessed that he knew more than the old arch-magi, Yebor. They were now so far from prosecuting him on account of the griffin, that they believed nothing but what he thought credible. There had reigned in Babylon, for the space of fifteen hundred years, a violent contest that had divided the empire into two sects. The one pretended that they ought to enter the temple of Mitra with the left foot foremost. The other held this custom in detestation, and always entered with the right foot first. The people waited with great impatience for the day on which the solemn feast of the sacred fire was to be celebrated, to see which sect Zadig would favor. All the world had their eyes fixed on his two feet, and the whole city was in the utmost suspense and perturbation. Zadig jumped into the temple with his feet joined together, and afterwards proved, in an eloquent discourse, that the sovereign of heaven and earth, who accepted not the persons of men, makes no distinction between the right and left foot. The envious man and his wife alleged that his discourse was not figurative enough, and that he did not make the rocks and mountains to dance with sufficient agility. "'He is dry,' said they, "'and void of genius.' He does not make the flea to fly, and stars to fall, nor the sun to melt wax. He has not the true oriental style. Zadig contented himself with having the style of reason. All the world favored him, not because he was in the right road, or followed the dictates of reason, or was a man of real merit, but because he was prime vizier. He terminated with the same happy address the grand difference between the white and the black magi. The former maintained that it was the height of impiety to pray to God with the face turned toward the east in winter. The latter asserted that God abhorred the prayers of those who turned toward the west in summer. Zadig decreed that every man should be allowed to turn as he pleased. Thus he found out the happy secret of finishing all affairs, whether of a private or public nature, in the morning. The rest of the day he employed in superintending and promoting the embellishments of Babylon. He exhibited tragedies that drew tears from the eyes of the spectators, and comedies that shook their sides with laughter. A custom which had long been disused, and which his good taste now induced him to revive. He never affected to be more knowing in the polite arts than the artists themselves. He encouraged them by rewards and honors, and was never jealous of their talents. In the evening the king was highly entertained with his conversation, and the queen still more. "'Great minister,' said the king. "'Amiable minister,' said the queen. And both of them added, it would have been a great loss to the state had such a man been hanged. Never was man in power obliged to give so many audiences to the ladies. Most of them came to consult him about no business at all, that so they might have some business with him. But none of them won his attention. 
Meanwhile Zadig perceived that his thoughts were always distracted, as well when he gave audience as when he sat in judgment. He did not know to what to attribute this absence of mind, and that was his only sorrow. He had a dream in which he imagined that he laid himself down upon a heap of dry herbs, among which there were many prickly ones that gave him great uneasiness, and that he afterwards reposed himself on a soft bed of roses, from which there sprung a serpent that wounded him to the heart with its sharp and venomed tongue. Alas, said he, I have long lain on these dry and prickly herbs. I am now on the bed of roses. But what shall be the serpent? Jealousy Zadig's calamities sprung even from his happiness, and especially from his merit. He every day conversed with the king and Astarte, his august comfort. The charms of his conversation were greatly heightened by that desire of pleasing, which is to the mind what dress is to beauty. His youth and graceful appearance insensibly made an impression on Astarte, which she did not at first perceive. Her passion grew and flourished in the bosom of innocence. Without fear or scruple, she indulged the pleasing satisfaction of seeing and hearing a man who was so dear to her husband, and to the empire in general. She was continually praising him to the king. She talked of him to her women, who were always sure to improve on her praises. And thus everything contributed to pierce her heart with a dart, of which she did not seem to be sensible. She made several presents to Zadig, which discovered a greater spirit of gallantry than she imagined. She intended to speak to him only as a queen satisfied with his services, and her expressions were sometimes those of a woman in love. Astarte was much more beautiful than that Samira, who had such a strong aversion to one-eyed men, or that other woman who had resolved to cut off her husband's nose, her unreserved familiarity, her tender expressions, at which she began to blush, and her eyes, which, though she endeavoured to divert them to other objects, were always fixed upon his, inspired Zadig with a passion that filled him with astonishment. He struggled hard to get the better of it. He called to his aid the precepts of philosophy, which had always stood him instead. But from thence, though he could derive the light of knowledge, he could procure no remedy to cure the disorders of his lovesick heart. Duty, gratitude, and violated majesty presented themselves to his mind as so many avenging gods. He struggled, he conquered, but this victory, which he was obliged to purchase afresh every moment, cost him many sighs and tears. He no longer dared to speak to the queen with that sweet and charming familiarity which had been so agreeable to them both. His countenance was covered with a cloud. His conversation was constrained and incoherent. His eyes were fixed on the ground, and when, in spite of all his endeavours to the contrary, they encountered those of the queen, they found them bathed in tears and darting arrows of flame. They seemed to say, we adore each other, and yet are afraid to love. We both burn with a fire, which we both condemn. Zadig left the royal presence, full of perplexity and despair, and having his heart oppressed with a burden which he was no longer able to bear. In the violence of his perturbation, he involuntarily betrayed the secret to his friend Cador in the same manner as a man who, having long supported the fits of a cruel disease, discovered his pain by a cry extorted from him by a more severe fit, and by the cold sweat that covers his brow. "'I have already discovered,' said Cador, "'the sentiments which thou wouldst fain conceal from thyself. The symptoms by which the passions show themselves are certain and infallible.' Judge, my dear Zadig, since I have read thy heart, whether the king will not discover something in it that may give him offence. 
he has no other fault but that of being the most jealous man in the world. Thou canst resist the violence of thy passion with greater fortitude than the queen, because thou art a philosopher, and because thou art Zadig. Astarte is a woman. She suffers her eyes to speak with so much the more imprudence, as she does not as yet think herself guilty. Conscious of her innocence, she unhappily neglects those external appearances which are so necessary. I shall tremble for her so long as she has nothing wherewithal to reproach herself. Were ye both of one mind, ye might easily deceive the whole world. A growing passion, which we endeavour to suppress, discovers itself, in spite of all our efforts to the contrary. But love, when gratified, is easily concealed. Zadig trembled at the proposal of betraying the king, his benefactor, and never was he more faithful to his prince than when guilty of an involuntary crime against him. Meanwhile, the queen mentioned the name of Zadig so frequently, and with such a blushing and downcast look. She was sometimes so lively, and sometimes so perplexed when she spoke to him in the king's presence, and was seized with such deep thoughtfulness at his going away, that the king began to be troubled. He believed all that he saw, and imagined all that he did not see. He particularly remarked that his wife's shoes were blue, and that Zadig's shoes were blue, that his wife's ribbons were yellow, and that Zadig's bonnet was yellow, and these were terrible symptoms to a prince of so much delicacy. In his jealous mind suspicions were turned into certainty. All the slaves of kings and queens are so many spies over their hearts. They soon observed that Astarte was tender, and that Moabdar was jealous. The envious man brought false reports to the king. The monarch now thought of nothing but in what manner he might best execute his vengeance. He one night resolved to poison the queen, and in the morning to put Zadig to death by the bowstring. The orders were given to a merciless eunuch, who commonly executed his acts of vengeance. There happened at that time to be in the king's chamber a little dwarf, who, though dumb, was not deaf. He was allowed, on account of his insignificance, to go wherever he pleased, and, as a domestic animal, was a witness of what passed in the most profound secrecy. This little mute was strongly attached to the queen and Zadig, with equal horror and surprise, he heard the cruel orders given. But how to prevent the fatal sentence that in a few hours was to be carried into execution? He could not write, but he could paint, and excelled particularly in drawing a striking resemblance. He employed a part of the night in sketching out with his pencil what he meant to impart to the queen. The piece represented the king in one corner, boiling with rage, and giving orders to the eunuch, a bowstring and a bowl on a table, the queen in the middle of the picture, expiring in the arms of her woman, and Zadig strangled at her feet. The horizon represented a rising sun, to express that this shocking execution was to be performed in the morning. As soon as he had finished the picture, he ran to one of Astarte's women, awakened her, and made her understand that she must immediately carry it to the queen. At midnight a messenger knocks at Zadig's door, awakes him, and gives him a note from the queen. He doubts whether it is a dream, and opens the letter with a trembling hand. But how great was his surprise! and who can express the consternation and despair into which he was thrown upon reading these words? Fly this instant, or thou art a dead man. Fly, Zadig, I conjure thee by our mutual love and my yellow ribbons. I have not been guilty, but I find I must die like a criminal. Zadig was hardly able to speak. He sent for Cador, and without uttering a word gave him the note. 
Cador forced him to obey, and forthwith to take the road to Memphis. "'Shouldst thou dare,' said he, "'to go in search of the queen, thou wilt hasten her death. Shouldst thou speak to the king, thou wilt infallibly ruin her. I will take upon me the charge of her destiny. Follow thy own. I will spread a report that thou hast taken the road to India. I will soon follow thee, and inform thee of all that shall have passed in Babylon. At that instant, Cador caused two of the swiftest dromedaries to be brought to a private gate of the palace. Upon one of these he mounted Zadig, whom he was obliged to carry to the door, and who was ready to expire with grief. He was accompanied by a single domestic, and Cador, plunged in sorrow and astonishment, soon lost sight of his friend. This illustrious fugitive, arriving on the side of a hill, from whence he could take a view of Babylon, turned his eyes toward the queen's palace, and fainted away at the sight. Nor did he recover his senses, but to shed a torrent of tears, and to wish for death. At length, after his thoughts had been long engrossed in lamenting the unhappy fate of the loveliest woman and the greatest queen in the world, he for a moment turned his views on himself, and cried, What then is human life? O virtue, how hast thou served me? Two women have basely deceived me, and now a third, who is innocent and more beautiful than both the others, is going to be put to death. Whatever good I have done hath been to me a continual source of calamity and affliction, and I have only been raised to the height of grandeur, to be tumbled down the most horrid precipice of misfortune. Filled with these gloomy reflections, his eyes overspread with the veil of grief, his countenance covered with the paleness of death, and his soul plunged in an abyss of the blackest despair, he continued his journey toward Egypt. THE WOMAN BEATEN Zadig directed his course by the stars. The constellation of Orion and the splendid dog-star guided his steps toward the pole of Cassiopeia. He admired those vast globes of light, which appear to our eyes but as so many little sparks, while the earth, which in reality is only an imperceptible point in nature, appears to our fond imaginations as something so grand and noble. He then represented to himself the human species as it really is, as a parcel of insects devouring one another on a little atom of clay. This true image seemed to annihilate his misfortunes, by making him sensible of the nothingness of his own being, and of that of Babylon. His soul launched out into infinity, and detached from the senses, contemplated the immutable order of the universe. But when afterwards, returning to himself, and entering into his own heart, he considered that Astarte had perhaps died for him, the universe vanished from his sight, and he beheld nothing in the whole compass of nature, but Astarte expiring, and Zadig unhappy. While he thus alternately gave up his mind to this flux and reflux of sublime philosophy and intolerable grief, he advanced toward the frontiers of Egypt, and his faithful domestic was already in the first village, in search of a lodging. Upon reaching the village, Zadig generously took the part of a woman attacked by her jealous lover. The combat grew so fierce that Zadig slew the lover. The Egyptians were then just and humane. The people conducted Zadig to the town-house. They first of all ordered his wound to be dressed, and then examined him and his servant apart, in order to discover the truth. They found that Zadig was not an assassin, but, as he was guilty of having killed a man, the law condemned him to be a slave. His two camels were sold for the benefit of the town, all the gold he had brought with him was distributed among the inhabitants, and his person, as well as that of the companion of his journey, was exposed to sale in the market-place. An Arabian merchant, named Setoc, 
made the purchase. But as the servant was fitter for labor than the master, he was sold at a higher price. There was no comparison between the two men. Thus, Zadig became a slave subordinate to his own servant. They were linked together by a chain fastened to their feet, and in this condition they followed the Arabian merchant to his house. By the way, Zadig comforted his servant and exhorted him to patience, but he could not help making, according to his usual custom, some reflections on human life. "'I see,' said he, that the unhappiness of my fate hath an influence on thine. Hitherto everything has turned out to me in a most unaccountable manner. I have been condemned to pay a fine for having seen the marks of a spaniel's feet. I thought that I should once have been impaled on account of a griffin. I have been sent to execution for having made some verses in praise of the king. I have been upon the point of being strangled, because the queen had yellow ribbons. And now I am a slave with thee, because a brutal wretch beat his mistress. Come, let us keep a good heart. All this, perhaps, will have an end. The Arabian merchants must necessarily have slaves. And why not me as well as another, since, as well as another, I am a man? This merchant will not be cruel. He must treat his slaves well, if he expects any advantage from them. But while he spoke thus, his heart was entirely engrossed by the fate of the Queen of Babylon. Two days after, the merchant Setoc set out for Arabia Deserta, with his slaves and his camels. His tribe dwelt near the desert of Oreb. The journey was long and painful. Setoc set a much greater value on the servant than the master, because the former was more expert in loading the camels, and all the little marks of distinction were shown to him. A camel having died within two days' journey of Oreb, his burden was divided and laid on the backs of the servants, and Zadig had his share among the rest. Setoc laughed to see all his slaves walking with their bodies inclined. Zadig took the liberty to explain to him the cause, and inform him of the laws of the balance. The merchant was astonished, and began to regard him with other eyes. Zadig, finding he had raised his curiosity, increased it still further by acquainting him with many things that related to commerce, the specific gravity of metals, and commodities under an equal bulk, the properties of several useful animals, and the means of rendering those useful that are not naturally so. At last Setoc began to consider Zadig as a sage, and preferred him to his companion, whom he had formerly so much esteemed. He treated him well, and had no cause to repent of his kindness." THE STONE. As soon as Setoc arrived among his own tribe, he demanded the payment of five hundred ounces of silver, which he had lent to a Jew in presence of two witnesses. But as the witnesses were dead, and the debt could not be proved, the Hebrew appropriated the merchant's money to himself, and piously thanked God for putting it in his power to cheat an Arabian. Setoc imparted this troublesome affair to Zadig, who was now become his counsel. "'In what place,' said Zadig, "'didst thou lend the five hundred ounces to this infidel?' "'Upon a large stone,' replied the merchant, "'that lies near Mount Oreb. "'What is the character of thy debtor?' said Zadig. "'That of a knave,' returned Setoc. But I ask thee whether he is lively or phlegmatic, cautious or imprudent. He is, of all bad payers, said Setoc, the most lively fellow I ever knew. Well, resumed Zadig, allow me to plead thy cause. In effect, Zadig, having summoned the Jew to the tribunal, addressed the judge in the following terms. 
Pillow of the throne of equity, I come to demand of this man, in the name of my master, five hundred ounces of silver, which he refuses to pay. Hast thou any witnesses? said the judge. No, they are dead, but there remains a large stone upon which the money was counted, and if it please thy grandeur to order the stone to be sought for, I hope that it will bear witness. The Hebrew and I will tarry here till the stone arrives. I will send for it at my master's expense. With all my heart, replied the judge, and immediately applied himself to the discussion of other affairs. When the court was going to break up, the judge said to Zadig, Well, friend, is not thy stone come yet? The Hebrew replied with a smile, Thy grandeur may stay here till the morrow, and after all not see the stone. It is more than six miles from hence, and it would require fifteen men to move it. Well, cried Zadig, did not I say that the stone would bear witness? Since this man knows where it is, he thereby confesses that it was upon it that the money was counted. The Hebrew was disconcerted, and was soon after obliged to confess the truth. The judge ordered him to be fastened to the stone without meat or drink, till he should restore the five hundred ounces which were soon after paid. The slave Zadig and the stone were held in great repute in Arabia. THE FUNERAL PILE Setoc, charmed with the happy issue of this affair, made his slave his intimate friend. He had now conceived as great esteem for him as ever the king of Babylon had done, and Zadig was glad that Setoc had no wife. He discovered in his master a good natural disposition, much probity of heart, and a great share of good sense. But he was sorry to see that, according to the ancient custom of Arabia, he adored the host of heaven, that is, the sun, moon, and stars. He sometimes spoke to him on this subject with great prudence and discretion. At last he told him that these bodies were like all other bodies in the universe, and no more deserving of our homage than a tree or a rock. But, said Setoc, they are eternal beings, and it is from them we derive all we enjoy. They animate nature, they regulate the seasons, and besides are removed at such an immense distance from us that we cannot help revering them. Thou receivest more advantage, replied Zadig, from the waters of the Red Sea, which carry thy merchandise to the Indies. Why may not it be as ancient as the stars? And if thou adorest what is placed at a distance from thee, thou oughtest to adore the land of the Gangarides, which lies at the extremity of the earth. No, said Setoc. The brightness of the stars command my adoration. At night Zadig lighted up a great number of candles in the tent where he was to sup with Setoc, and the moment his patron appeared, he fell on his knees before these lighted tapers, and said, Eternal and shining luminaries, be ye always propitious to me. Having thus said, he sat down at table without taking the least notice of Setoc. "'What art thou doing?' said Setoc to him in amaze. "'I act like thee,' replied Zadig. "'I adore these candles, and neglect their master and mine.' Setoc comprehended the profound sense of this apologue. The wisdom of his slave sunk deep into his soul. He no longer offered incense to the creatures, but adored the eternal being who made them. There prevailed at that time in Arabia a shocking custom, sprung originally from Scythia, and which, being established in the Indies by the credit of the Brahmins, threatened to overrun all the East. 
when a married man died and his beloved wife aspired to the character of a saint she burned herself publicly on the body of her husband this was a solemn feast and was called the funeral pile of widowhood and that tribe in which most women had been burned was the most respected an arabian of setoc's tribe being dead his widow whose name was almona and who was very devout published the day and hour when she intended to throw herself into the fire amidst the sound of drums and trumpets zadig remonstrated against this horrible custom he showed setoc how inconsistent it was with the happiness of mankind to suffer young widows to burn themselves every other day widows who were capable of giving children to the state or at least of educating those they already had and he convinced him that it was his duty to do all that lay in his power to abolish such a barbarous practice the women said setoc have possessed the right of burning themselves for more than a thousand years and who shall dare to abrogate a law which time hath rendered sacred is there anything more respectable than ancient abuses reason is more ancient replied zadig meanwhile speak thou to the chiefs of the tribes and i will go to wait on the young widow accordingly he was introduced to her and after having insinuated himself into her good graces by some compliments on her beauty and told her what a pity it was to commit so many charms to the flames, he at last praised her for her constancy and courage. Thou must surely have loved thy husband, said he to her, with the most passionate fondness. Who, I? replied the lady. I loved him not at all. He was a brutal, jealous, insupportable wretch, but I am firmly resolved to throw myself on his funeral pile. It would appear then, said Zadig, that there must be a very delicious pleasure in being burned alive. Oh, it makes nature shudder, replied the lady, but that must be overlooked. I am a devotee, and I should lose my reputation, and all the world would despise me if I did not burn myself. Zadig, having made her acknowledge that she burned herself to gain the good opinion of others, and to gratify her own vanity, entertained her with a long discourse, calculated to make her a little in love with life, and even went so far as to inspire her with some degree of good will for the person who spoke to her. Alas, said the lady, I believe I should desire thee to marry me. Zadig's mind was too much engrossed with the idea of Astarte not to elude this declaration, but he instantly went to the chiefs of the tribes, told them what had passed, and advised them to make a law by which a widow should not be permitted to burn herself till she had conversed privately with a young man for the space of an hour. Since that time not a single woman hath burned herself in Arabia, they were indebted to Zadig alone for destroying in one day a cruel custom that had lasted for so many ages, and thus he became the benefactor of Arabia. THE SUPPER Setoc, who could not separate himself from this man, in whom dwelt wisdom, carried him to the great fair of Belzora, whither the richest merchants in the earth resorted. Zadig was highly pleased to see so many men of different countries united in the same place. He considered the whole universe as one large family assembled at Belzora. Setoc, after having sold his commodities at a very high price, returned to his own tribe with his friend Zadig, who learned, upon his arrival, that he had been tried in his absence, and was now going to be burned by a slow fire. Only the friendship of Almona saved his life. Like so many pretty women, she possessed great influence with the priesthood. 
Zadig thought it best to leave Arabia. Setoc was so charmed with the ingenuity and address of Almona that he made her his wife. Zadig departed, after having thrown himself at the feet of his fair deliverer. Setoc and he took leave of each other with tears in their eyes, swearing an eternal friendship, and promising that the first of them that should acquire a large fortune should share it with the other. Zadig directed his course along the frontiers of Assyria, still musing on the unhappy Astarte, and reflecting on the severity of fortune, which seemed determined to make him the sport of her cruelty, and the object of her persecution. What, said he to himself, four hundred ounces of gold for having seen a spaniel, condemned to lose my head for four bad verses in praise of the king, ready to be strangled because the queen had ribbons of the color of my bonnet, reduced to slavery for having succored a woman who was beat, and on the point of being burned for having saved the lives of all the young widows of Arabia. THE ROBBER Arriving on the frontiers which divide Arabia Petraea from Syria, he passed by a pretty strong castle, from which a party of armed Arabians sallied forth. They instantly surrounded him, and cried, All thou hast belongs to us, and thy person is the property of our master. Zadig replied by drawing his sword. His servant, who was a man of courage, did the same. They killed the first Arabians that presumed to lay hands on them, and though the number was redoubled, they were not dismayed, but resolved to perish in the conflict. Two men defended themselves against a multitude, and such a combat could not last long. The master of the castle, whose name was Arbogad, having observed from a window the prodigies of valor performed by Zadig, conceived a high esteem for this heroic stranger. He descended in haste, and went in person to call off his men, and deliver the two travellers. "'All that passes over my lands,' said he, "'belongs to me, as well as what I find upon the lands of others. But thou seemest to be a man of such undaunted courage, that I will exempt thee from the common law.' He then conducted him to his castle, ordering his men to treat him well. And in the evening Arbogad supped with Zadig. The lord of the castle was one of those Arabians who are commonly called robbers, but he now and then performed some good actions amid a multitude of bad ones. He robbed with a furious rapacity, and granted favors with great generosity. He was intrepid in action, affable in company, a debauchee at table, but gay in debauchery, and particularly remarkable for his frank and open behavior. He was highly pleased with Zadig, whose lively conversation lengthened the repast. At last Arbogad said to him, I advise thee to enroll thy name in my catalogue. Thou canst not do better. This is not a bad trade, and thou mayest one day become what I am at present. May I take the liberty of asking thee, said Zadig, how long thou hast followed this noble profession? From my most tender youth, replied the lord. I was a servant to a pretty good-natured Arabian, but could not endure the hardships of my situation. I was vexed to find that fate had given me no share of the earth, which equally belongs to all men. I imparted the cause of my uneasiness to an old Arabian, who said to me, My son, do not despair. There was once a grain of sand that lamented that it was no more than a neglected atom in the deserts. At the end of a few years it became a diamond and is now the brightest ornament in the crown of the king of the Indies. This discourse made a deep impression on my mind. I was the grain of sand, and I resolved to become the diamond. I began by stealing two horses. I soon got a party of companions. 
I put myself in a condition to rob small caravans, and thus, by degrees, I destroyed the difference which had formerly subsisted between me and other men. I had my share of the good things of this world, and was even recompensed with usury for the hardships I had suffered. I was greatly respected, and became the captain of a band of robbers. I seized this castle by force. The satrap of Syria had a mind to dispossess me of it, but I was too rich to have anything to fear. I gave the satrap a handsome present, by which means I preserved my castle and increased my possessions. He even appointed me treasurer of the tributes which Arabia Petraea pays to the king of kings. I perform my office of receiver with great punctuality, but take the freedom to dispense with that of paymaster. The grand Desterham of Babylon sent hither a pretty satrap in the name of King Moabdar to have me strangled. This man arrived with his orders. I was apprised of all. I caused to be strangled in his presence the four persons he had brought with him to draw the noose. After which I asked him how much his commission of strangling me might be worth. He replied that his fees would amount to above three hundred pieces of gold. I then convinced him that he might gain more by staying with me. I made him an inferior robber, and he is now one of my best and richest officers. If thou wilt take my advice, thy success may be equal to his. Never was there a better season for plunder, since King Moabdar is killed, and all Babylon thrown into confusion. Moabdar killed? said Zadig. And what has become of Queen Astarte? I know not, replied Arbogad. All I know is that Moabdar lost his senses and was killed, that Babylon is a scene of disorder and bloodshed, that all the empire is desolated, that there are some fine strokes to be struck yet, and that for my own part I have struck some that are admirable. But the queen, said Zadig, for heaven's sake, knowest thou nothing of the queen's fate? Yes, replied he, I have heard something of a prince of Hyrcania. If she was not killed in the tumult, she is probably one of his concubines. But I am much fonder of booty than news. I have taken several women in my excursions, but I keep none of them. I sell them at a high price when they are beautiful, without inquiring who they are. In commodities of this kind rank makes no difference, and a queen that is ugly will never find a merchant. Perhaps I may have sold Queen Astarte. Perhaps she is dead. But, be it as it will, it is of little consequence to me, and I should imagine of as little to thee. So saying, he drank a large draught, which threw all his ideas into such confusion that Zadig could obtain no further information. Zadig remained for some time without speech, sense, or motion. Arbogad continued drinking, told stories, constantly repeated that he was the happiest man in the world, and exhorted Zadig to put himself in the same condition. At last the soporiferous fumes of the wine lulled him into a gentle repose. Zadig passed the night in the most violent perturbation. What, said he, did the king lose his senses? And is he killed? I cannot help lamenting his fate. The empire is rent in pieces, and this robber is happy. O oh, fortune, O oh, destiny, a robber is happy and the most beautiful of nature's works, hath perhaps perished in a barbarous manner, or lives in a state worse than death? O oh, Astarte, what is become of thee? At daybreak he questioned all those he met in the castle, but they were all busy, and he received no answer. During the night they had made a new capture, and they were now employed in dividing the spoils. All he could obtain in this hurry and confusion was an opportunity of departing, which he immediately embraced, plunged deeper than ever in the most gloomy and mournful reflections. 
Zadig proceeded on his journey with a mind full of disquiet and perplexity, and wholly employed on the unhappy Astarte, on the king of Babylon, on his faithful friend Cador, on the happy robber Arbogad, in a word, on all the misfortunes and disappointments he had hitherto suffered. THE FISHERMAN at a few leagues distance from Arbogad's castle he came to the banks of a small river, still deploring his fate and considering himself as the most wretched of mankind. He saw a fisherman lying on the brink of the river, scarcely holding, in his weak and feeble hand, a net which he seemed ready to drop, and lifting up his eyes to heaven. I am certainly, said the fisherman, the most unhappy man in the world. I was universally allowed to be the most famous dealer in cream cheese in Babylon, and yet I am ruined. I had the most handsome wife that any man in my station could have, and by her I have been betrayed. I had still left a paltry house, and that I have seen pillaged and destroyed. At last I took refuge in this cottage, where I have no other resource than fishing. And yet I cannot catch a single fish. O oh, my net, no more will I throw thee into the water. I will throw myself in thy place. So saying, he arose, and advanced forward in the attitude of a man ready to throw himself into the river, and thus to finish his life. "'What?' said Zadig to himself. "'Are there men as wretched as I?' His eagerness to save the fisherman's life was as this reflection. He ran to him, stopped him, and spoke to him with a tender and compassionate air. "'It is commonly supposed that we are less miserable when we have companions in our misery. This, according to Zoroaster, does not proceed from malice, but necessity. We feel ourselves insensibly drawn to an unhappy person as to one like ourselves. The joy of the happy would be an insult. But two men in distress are like two slender trees, which, mutually supporting each other, fortify themselves against the storm. Why, said Zadig to the fisherman, dost thou sink under thy misfortunes? "'Because,' replied he, "'I see no means of relief. "'I was the most considerable man in the village of Durlback, near Babylon, "'and with the assistance of my wife I made the best cream cheese in the empire. "'Queen Astarte and the famous minister Zadig were extremely fond of them.' "'Zadig, transported, said, "'What, knowst thou nothing of the queen's fate?' "'No, my lord,' replied the fisherman, "'but I know that neither the queen nor Zadig "'has paid me for my cream cheeses, "'that I have lost my wife "'and am now reduced to despair.' "'I flatter myself,' said Zadig, "'that thou wilt not lose all thy money. "'I have heard of this, Zadig. "'He is an honest man, "'and if he returns to Babylon as he expects,' He will give thee more than he owes thee. Believe me, go to Babylon. I shall be there before thee, because I am on horseback, and thou art on foot. Apply to the illustrious Cador. Tell him thou hast met his friend. Wait for me at his house. Go. Perhaps thou wilt not always be unhappy. O powerful Oromazes, continued he, Thou employest me to comfort this man. Whom wilt thou employ to give me consolation? So saying, he gave the fisherman half the money he had brought from Arabia. The fisherman, struck with surprise and ravished with joy, kissed the feet of the friend of Cador, and said, Thou art surely an angel sent from heaven to save me. Meanwhile, Zadig continued to make fresh inquiries, and to shed tears. "'What, my lord?' cried the fisherman. "'Art thou then so unhappy, thou who bestowest favours?' 
an hundred times more unhappy than thou art, replied Zadig. But how is it possible, said the good man, that the giver can be more wretched than the receiver? Because, replied Zadig, thy greatest misery arose from poverty, and mine is seated in the heart. Did Orcan take thy wife from thee? said the fisherman. This word recalled to Zadig's mind the whole of his adventures. He repeated the catalogue of his misfortunes, beginning with the queen's spaniel, and ending with his arrival at the castle of the robber Arbogad. Ah, said he to the fisherman, Orcan deserves to be punished, but it is commonly such men as those that are the favourites of fortune. However, go thou to the house of Lord Cador, and there wait my arrival. They then parted. The fisherman walked, thanking heaven for the happiness of his condition, and Zadig rode, accusing fortune for the hardness of his lot. End of section 19